Welcome to People in Profit. I'm Kate Moody. Coming up, insurance in times of crisis. Does the industry still protect you? And how is it changing? We'll speak to the head of an insure tech firm about what works and what doesn't. Cambodia's digital money era. The central bank launched a high-tech payments platform in 2020. Our correspondents have been finding out what impact it's had on businesses and the economy. And from fries to fuel, the famous water buses of Venice are now being powered by biodiesel made from used cooking oil. Insurance policies are indispensable for most consumers and businesses around the world. But with the cost of living soaring, so has the price of that insurance. A survey of households in the US and Europe suggests around half of them have seen their insurance premiums go up in the last year, but nearly 8 in 10 have nevertheless stuck with their existing policies. A quarter of those surveyed say they're not confident their insurer would pay out a claim, while a third say they have experienced that problem firsthand. Let's speak now to Julian Taika, founder and CEO of WeFox. That's the insure tech company that produced that survey. Thank you for joining us today. I want to start by asking you, why is there so little public trust in the insurance industry? Insurance is actually a beautiful product, um, but it has lost its way. Um, so um, it has turned into a money-making machine um, where more and more profits were generated and the customer didn't really play a very important role. Um, it was all around how can we get more, squeeze more money out of our customers. And if you look at insurance compared to banks, um, compared to retail, um, you see the difference in customer experience. Um, you see that it was never really around the customer in the last decades. It was only about getting in more money from customers to pay uh, to receive more returns from capital investments and to have higher returns by paying out less and making the claims process very difficult. Um, over the last decades, the insurance industry, one of the most important industries in the world, has lost the trust of the consumer. And over the last couple of years with the pandemic and the current inflation crisis, we've seen surveys have suggested anyway that that distrust has deepened. Can you talk us through that? We know that during the lockdowns, for example, a lot of businesses were saying uh, that it turned out they weren't covered for government mandated closures, for example. Uh, so essentially, insurance CEOs over the last decades always said, how can I get the most possible money into my money multiplication machine to make more money? And with a product like insurance, that you're not going to get up on a Sunday morning and say, oh, I want to really look at what potentially happens if I lose my job. Um, it is a much more difficult sell. And they realized the only way to do this is by getting salespeople um, to push products onto customers. And then the salespeople said, if you want us to make as much money as possible for you, I need very complex products so they don't understand what I'm selling them. Ideally, I can sell them the same coverage twice. And please don't create any transparency so they can charge more money than competitors without the customer even noticing. If your goal is money maximization, that's what I need from you. And on that premise, the insurance industry has developed products. It hasn't developed products on the premise of really protecting the customer, which is the purpose of insurance. And this has led to a complexity um, that we can see, for example, in the pandemic, where certain terms were not covered without the customer that was paying monthly even knowing about it and creating a different, a wrong level of expectation that led to a big um, disappointment in insurance companies, paying, 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 sometimes for years, decades, and then when you need it, they're not there for you. Households and businesses around the world are dealing with this sharp rise in the cost of living. Insurance premiums are also getting more and more expensive. Is insurance something that we might see people trying to reduce? Might they try to change or, or switch to cheaper policies as they get more expensive and they're no longer sure that they're really worthwhile? Actually, when the economy has a downturn, we see the opposite effect. Uh, we see people protecting what they have got. Um, so we actually see insurance coverage go up rather than down, which seems to be counterintuitive. Uh, one of the things that we're also seeing in downturns 
is that frauds go up. Um, so people that need money and believe that by making a fraudulent claim, they can get money that they need for a living. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a very important industry um, in a downturn. Um, it is there to protect what the people have worked for, what they've got, but there's also a lot of risks involved for insurers to defend themselves from fraudulent claims. What is different about your company, WeFux, as compared to traditional insurance companies? You describe it as insure tech, not just insurance. What does that mean very concretely? We have understood that insurance has lost its way. And we really have been founded on the premise of making our customers be safe. And while the insurance uh, industry is complex, it's complicated, seems to be unfair based on the study and old fashioned, we have really thought reinvented insurance from the customer's perspective. Um, so insurance policies with us are very easy to understand, are very fair and completely digital. Um, so we pay out claims and we believe that's the moment of truth in insurance. We pay out claims faster than anyone and we try to really make the customer feel that we care in this difficult moment for them in their life. Does that approach include using personal data to tailor insurance policies? We believe that with technology uh, come huge advantages for the insurance industry. And with insurance, um, uh, we will see that it will change from um, just paying out after something bad has happened to preventing before something bad happens. Because no person wants a car accident. No person wants to be robbed or get a disease. So this is where technology comes in. And we believe um, that with technology, so every person is going to have around 15 devices connected to the internet by 2025. So now all of a sudden we have a lot of data in real time that could prevent bad things from happening. And that's in the interest of the customer and of us. It will completely change insurance from a product that essentially is not part of our lives. We forget what's in the policies um, and we're disappointed if, if, if the insurance companies don't pay out to a product that's loved um, and that people use on a daily basis to live longer and healthier lives. And this is really what WeFox um, does um, and um, has brought us um, to now be the largest uh, insure tech in the world, focus on Europe right now, but soon global expansion. All right, Julian Taika, thank you so much for taking some time to speak to us on People and Profit today. Thank you. Next, checks, cash, even credit cards are increasingly a thing of the past in Cambodia. In 2020, the central bank launched a nationwide digital payments platform called the Bakong. The goal was to enable faster and more secure financial transactions and contribute to economic development. But is it working? Our correspondents Juliette Buches and Francois Camps have this report. It's become almost automatic for Cambodians, scanning their phones to pay. Be it in small restaurants or at supermarket tills, digital payments are now the norm here. Credit cards are no longer needed. They've been replaced by QR codes that allow instant transfers. I've been offering QR code payments for the past year and a half. It's very convenient for customers. And it's more secure too because the money goes directly into my account. The platform behind these QR codes is the Bakong, a secure blockchain-based payment system that was created in 2020 by the National Bank of Cambodia. Users can make payments and transfers in US dollars or Cambodian reals, the country's two currencies. The QR code is based on the Bakong. So really the Bakong is the building block for other payment system infrastructure developments in the country. It's a financial revolution in the only country in the world to have once abolished money. The Khmer Rouge conducted the experiment in the 1970s and it left its mark on Cambodia for decades. Until 2020, it was extremely difficult to transfer money from one bank to another. Then came the Bakong that finally connected Cambodia's 130 banking institutions. 
Before, it was like having a mobile phone subscription from one company, but not being able to call your family with it because they had a plan with a different company. Since the early 2000s, Cambodia has seen rapid economic progress driven by a connected youth. I almost only use digital payment to buy food, clothes and anything else. The payment is instantaneous. Last year, more than 8 million Bakong transactions were recorded, with a total value of 3.5 billion euros. Cruising through the canals of Venice on a water bus is a time-honored tradition, one that's now a little bit greener. The Vaporetti, once run on steam, then on diesel, are now being powered by biodiesel, developed from cooking oil that's collected from the city's restaurants. Leo McGuinn has more. A visit to Venice is sure to include a trip on the canal, whether that be by gondola, taxi, rowboat, or Vaporetto. This method of public transport has become the emblem of the floating city. And now, the fuel for these water buses is made from cooking oil, a method that is cheaper, greener, and totally odorless. But where does all this oil come from? The answer, the local restaurants of Venice. Just one of these restaurants produces 100 litres of used oil per month in the kitchen and stores it in these containers, ready to use. Before, we used to throw it all in the water. Now, the oil no longer ends up in the canal, and the water quality has improved. You can see a lot more fish in the canals now. That's very important. The used oil is transformed into biodiesel on the other side of the lagoon, at Porto Marghera, the biggest biorefinery in Italy. Here, older oil is treated and turned into biodiesel, which results in a 15 to 40 percent reduction in polluting emissions. The cooking oil is processed in this area. We're eliminating all pollutants and toxic elements contained in cooking oil. The new measures have been particularly appreciated by Venetian boatmen, who recently protested, demanding more anti-pollution action. One measure already implemented, these massive cruise ships no longer allowed to enter the historic center of Venice. That's all for now. Don't forget you can find this and our previous shows on the France 24 website or as a podcast wherever you usually listen. You can also get in touch with your comments and questions on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching.